Welcome to Catholic Courses. I'm your professor, Dr. Anthony Esselin. In this course, we are going to be discussing the first part of Dante Alighieri's epic poem, The Divine Comedy. Over the next eight lectures, we're going to be traveling through the inferno in a word, hell. Dante Alighieri is arguably the greatest poet who ever lived. He was born in Florence in 1265, in an exciting time when new religious orders, the Franciscans and the Dominicans, were flourishing throughout Europe and teaching in a new invention called the university. Great cathedrals filled with color and light rose up in towns and cities from England to Sicily. Popular culture was vibrant and bright. International trade was bustling and made many families rich, especially in Florence. Poets had embarked upon a tradition of love poetry that has lasted till our own time. Now, some years after he was exiled from Florence following a fit of political strife, Dante conceived the idea of combining all the great concerns of his time into a single poem, the Divine Comedy. He divided the poem into three canticles, Inferno, Purgatory, and the final canticle, Paradise, which he completed shortly before his death in 1321. Each canticle is further divided into cantos, 34 of them in Inferno, and 33 each in Purgatory and Paradise, making a full 100. The number 33 is significant because it was believed to be the age of Jesus when he died and rose again. However, the Inferno, the realm of sin, is not worthy to bear that number. And as we'll see, the very name of Christ is never uttered in hell. It's not easy to say what the Divine Comedy is about because, in fact, it is about everything of meaning in a human life. What does one's love for a beautiful woman have to do with the love of God? What does justice demand in our relationships with one another in our cities? What is wealth? How are we to use it? How much can we learn by the use of reason alone? And how much do we need divine revelation for? What is sin? And what does sin do to our hearts and our intellects? How does the grace of God heal us? What is the fulfillment of the human mind, the good of the intellect? What does love have to do with knowledge? Where are we going? And what is the path that leads to beatitude? Dante was the man to write this epic. Some people who don't know what they're talking about say that the Middle Ages were a time of darkness. No, this is absurd. The age of Dante was a vigorous, brilliant, and glorious time. A man like Dante knew several modern languages as a matter of course, and he was absolutely steeped in Latin. He knew theology, philosophy, history, astronomy, music, and all the rest of what we'd call the liberal arts. And he wrote his poem not for dusty professors in their libraries. If he had had them in mind, he'd have written it in Latin. No, Dante wrote in Italian for anyone who could read. And he casts himself as the main character in his own poem, not as a wise teacher, but as a man like us, like anyone, lost in sin, a man who needs the grace of God to lead him back to the path that leads to bliss. In other words, the Dante we meet in the poem is a great and brilliant fellow, but he's also any one of us. He is an everyman. So when we read about Dante, we read about ourselves. Now, to, to maximize your understanding of this lecture and all of our following lectures, please do read beforehand the cantos I'll be discussing in each lecture. In this first lecture, we're going to discuss cantos one through three. In these cantos, we will meet Dante, the pilgrim poet, and his guide through hell, Virgil. And we will enter the terrible gates of hell, moved to embark upon the pilgrimage, not by curiosity, but by a terrible acknowledgement of sin and a longing for divine love. So with all this information in mind, let's begin. Nel mezzo del cammin di nostra vita, mi ritrovai per una selva oscura, che la diretta via era smarita. In the middle of the journey of our life, I found myself in a dark wilderness, for I had wandered from the straight and true. So begins the greatest poem ever written, Dante's Divine Comedy. 
There is no introduction in this first canto. There is no rehearsal of past mistakes. There is no hint of childhood ways now forgotten. We're simply and suddenly there with our narrator in this mysterious wilderness, lost and in dismay. But even if our narrator cannot yet get his bearings, we can by attending to the subtleties of his language. Our poet Dante seldom wastes a single word. He has called it the journey of our life. Why? Now, if we no longer speak of our lives in these terms, it's because we've lost the strong sense that we are supposed to be going somewhere. We are, as St. Paul says about our father Abraham, strangers in a strange land. St. Augustine says that we are made for praising God and that our hearts are restless until they rest in Him. And that means that our true country, our patria, to use the Latin word, is the land of our Father, literally the land of our Father in heaven, the city of God, towards which our hearts incline when we follow the law of God and accept His grace. And so we see how terrible the poet's situation is. He has, as he tells us, wandered from the straight and true. And we may recall the words of Jesus, that the highway is broad that leads to destruction. It's regular Interstate 95. But straight and narrow is the path to salvation. So now our narrator has not only lost his way, he's woken up from a kind of stupor. He was full of sleep, he says when he abandoned the true road. And now he finds himself in a selva oscura, a dark woods, a savage wilderness. For people of the Middle Ages, the woods was no romantic place to get away from the hustle of the city. The city or the town or the village was a beloved home with the noise of merriment and often the cries of rivalry and strife to be in the woods is literally to be in a nowhere land, to have sunk beneath the level of man, man who is made to be a citizen. So what kind of sleep has brought Dante to this pass? It is the stupor of sin which clouds the intellect and makes the will feeble. Our poet looks toward heaven and he sees a mountain robed with the sun, that light of heaven that leads all men aright on every road. I'll follow that son, he says to himself. But alas, he cannot. As he climbs the hill, trying to follow that son, he's confronted by three beasts, a spotted leopard or lynx, a lion, and most sinister of all, a scrawny and ravenous she-wolf who had made many live in wretchedness, as Dante says. Many commentators associate the beasts with lust, pride, and avarice, the lynx with lust, the lion obviously with pride, and the wolf, the ravenous wolf with avarice. We might also say that they represent sins of the flesh, the lynx, sins of the devil, the prideful lion, and sins of the world, the greedy wolf. If so, they cover the entire field. And our lost poet cannot on his own overcome these beasts. As he says to us, he has lost all hope to gain the mountaintop. Now, the word hope here is crucial, as we shall see. If we rely upon our own strength for salvation, we must lose all hope. Inevitably, we do. We become like a gambler, Dante suggests. The gambler is happy while he's winning. But then inevitably comes the time when he must give it all back in losses and, says Dante, turn his thoughts to weeping and despair. But the good news is that we don't have to rely upon ourselves. Eternal providence exceeding human thought can make a way where no way appears.